everyone. Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we go over all of the news from the world of movies, plus a little insight into what it all means. Joining us, as usual, is John Campia. Hot damn, everybody! It's a good thing no big trailers <laughs> dropped yesterday at all. How you doing? Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Woo! <laughs> Woo! And we have Mark Ellis joining us. Yeah, I'm also here, and I am bummed. I am no longer the best-looking person on this show. I am really, <laughs> really disappointed. Yeah, Christian shaved. It was look good. Ah, uh, you yeah. took my joke, Camp. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, real okay. best-looking one, Christian Harloff. <laughs> I'll take that endorsement. I don't think Dane Cook's that good-looking. Hey, <laughs> Topher Grace, shut your mouth. Hey, and it's, if, for some of you guys who may have watched the show yesterday, uh, and maybe you didn't see the show yesterday, we are so thrilled to have Natasha Martinez with us here today. Thanks so much for being Yay! here. I'm thrilled to be she here. She is the too. newest part of our team. Uh, we are so excited that you're here, and let's get rolling let's on the first roll stuff of the right day. Let's roll right on through. All right, as most of you know, the newest Marvel film, Captain America Civil War, is heading to the big screen on May 6th, and now, hot on the heels of the trailer dropping just a few days ago, Entertainment Weekly's latest issue gives us a lot more insight into Black Panther. In the article, Marvel executive producer says this is about, he says this about the new character. He's someone who hasn't necessarily made up his mind about either side and whose agenda isn't exactly what Cap's agenda or what Tony's agenda is. And I think that brings him into conflict weirdly with both characters at different times in the film. He is the prince of an African nation that has so far stayed very much sort of in the shadows. And eventually the film will draw him and his father out of the shadows. John, what does this article tell you about, about Black Panther's role in the You know, Civil it's War? really fascinating because I think this article tells us a lot. Now, if you read the whole article, Kevin Feige also goes on to say, you know, we were trying to think about who this pivotal character was going to be. And we kept saying a black, a black pair... Uh, panther type character a black panther type character until finally somebody said how about black panther and they put him <laughs> in there then you know there's then the producer goes on to say a lot more about how the fact that he's kind of torn between the two now a year and a half ago now at yeah. that big uh, marvel phase three announcement that they did down at the el capitan theater just about a year ago about yeah, a year yeah, ago yeah, now yeah, a, little a year and a half ago. whatever yeah. They brought out, we're sitting there in the audience, the three of us were all yeah. there, right? Mm -hmm. We're sitting there in the audience, and out comes Tony Stark himself, Robert Downey Jr., out comes Chris Evans, and then out comes Black Panther. And he's standing in between <laughs> them, and they're tug-of-warring him. Basically, what this, these statements tell me is that what we suspected is actually true. Black Panther is the movie version of the role that Spider-Man was in the comic books. To me, it's becoming more and more clear that he kind of becomes that grenade pin, if you will, that, that one tug-of-war issue between the two guys, where Spider-Man kind of played that role in the first one. It also sort of confirms to me, if that's true, and we're making assumptions here, that Spider-Man does indeed play a very small role in this film. Uh, maybe significant. You can have it like Luke. You were mentioning pre-show that you know Luke in The Force Awakens is probably going to be a small role, but an incredibly significant one at the same time. So I believe we got a lot of info out of these thoughts. Anyway, Mark, what did you think about it? I believe that my good friend Kevin Feige did another great <laughs> thing by making Black Panther the cinematic version of Spider-Man, because like you said, they already had this storyline set for years before they even knew they were going to get the rights to Spider-Man, so it would have made no sense, or very bad sense, to throw Spider-Man in there and wedge him in and say, oh, Black Panther, thanks for showing up to the party. Now we got Spider-Man, <laughs> you can go sit in the corner. I like that he's going to be a central role. It's going to be a great film to watch. I didn't love all the pictures, and you know me, I'm not a big fan of reading. I will look at pictures first in a magazine. I didn't love, all, like, the oh, the kitty's got claws one, but like most of these things, the costume looks awesome. You so, see that picture on the cover says the little word meow? Yeah. Beside him, I was like, what was that? He looked like my cat Fred that I used to have. God, I miss Fred. <laughs> Christian. I love these comments, and I, and I think that what I do is you also, you have to applaud Marvel as well, too, because they could have once they got Spider-Man and they knew they could use him, they could have, there was a rumor that they were going to rewrite it and it was going to be they had two scripts and one of the scripts was if if it was the case that they got spider-man back then they would stick spider-man in the role that black panther was going to do well it seems like they didn't do that at all and that they have confidence in it they have confidence in bozeman and that they're going to really support this character and it sounds great i can't wait to see it, it also you're able to develop a brand new character we've developed spider-man so many different times and he will be developed again but take this opportunity in Civil War, which is gonna be such a huge movie, and for 
non-comic book fans who are going to be introduced to him the first way that he's going to be the mediator and the guy back and forth on both sides it's going to be a very strong character and it's also going to uh, give us a chance to really support a standalone movie once the black panther standalone movie comes yeah. so this is a way to really build up that character in this big movie i love him you make a great point too when you talk about how spider-man we've already <laughs> seen him so many times go through what happened to peter parker and how he became spider-man we don't need to see that again and the fact that we've seen so many movies about spider-man We've seen that origin story so many times. It makes this movie a lot easier to make because you don't want to see that. Fans don't care. If there's a civil war between a crap ton of superheroes, we don't need to see an origin story of anybody unless it's somebody we don't know. Black Panther is that guy's the perfect fit. But we all agree we are, we do want an origin of Aunt May, right? Like <laughs> yes. you and Schnepp have not yes. been working in that, vain. That movie is in production. Don't right. worry, Marissa Tomei is on my speed And now. one of the things that I think we are overlooking, and you can forgive all of us, you, us, everybody, overlooking because of how great the trailer was and all this great news, is that Chadwick Boseman is going to bring it. And when you got an actor of that caliber playing a character like this, oh, one other very interesting thing, in the article they also confirmed that, yes, Black Panther's outfit is made of vibranium, the right. same material that Captain America's shield is made out of. So f somehow they figure out a way to make it pliable. So, wow, that's a, yeah. that's that's science. That's like Morgan Freeman and Batman stuff, right <laughs> but there. It also, but it also ties in what they've been doing so far in the universe. You know, the way that when it was introduced in Ultron, and, yes. and like it's it really it ties it all together. And even the fact that they tied in the, the little the little tidbit of Black Panther and, and it, it was with the Andy Serkis character yeah. as well too. So I think that it's really smart. All right, what's next? All right, next, as most of you know, 21 Jump Street and the Lego Movie directors Phil Lord and Chris Miller are currently working on their upcoming Han Solo movie for Lucasfilm, set to be released in 2018. The outlet Heat Vision is now reporting that they have already auditioned over 2,500 potential Han Solos, including names like Aaron Taylor Johnson, Dave Franco, Miles Teller, Logan Lerman, Colton Haynes, and The Walking Dead's Chandler Riggs. Christian, what do you think? Think of the names we're seeing popping up for the young Han Solo role so far. Well, the ones that you just read, I don't like. But that doesn't mean that there's no, other ones in there. No, 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 pass, no. Pass, X, pass. X, X, Take X. off the cowboy hat before you audition, Riggs. <laughs> um, but for me, it's it, that's. But what it also, I love the story though. I love the story because they know you see everyone because you can't screw this one up oh you cannot <laughs> it's like you have to see people that are 16 you have to see people that are 30 and and 80 if you have to see everybody and get the right person you have some time Kasdan already has a lot of, uh, has the script kind of mapped out because I believe that Kasdan worked on this even before he was working on The Force Awakens. He, he's got, he really wants to do this movie. Um, so, and I still think, and I never get his name right, and I should because I love the movie so much, but the Kingsman kid. George Lucas. George Lucas. Um, the Kingsman kid is going <laughs> like, to get the role. Take it to the Tar Tar uh, uh, I'm Grand Moff Tarkin. Grand Moff Tarkin that, in the role. Taron Egert, I think. Taron Egert Egerton. Egert. No, that's that's, no, not, not, that's not Joel, Joel Egerton. Egerton. Egert. Ta uh, yes. We'll look it up. They'll tell us. They're going to tell us. <laughs> they can yell at us in a second. Anyway, here. Look, I actually think what is fascinating about this list is that you got Coral from The Walking Dead with the cowboy hat and all, who is 16 <laughs> years old auditioning for the role. Did you call him Coral. Coral. <laughs> Because that's how we pronounce it yeah. out there. Quarrel. Anyway, and then you've got the dude from, um, uh, what's that robot show? Mr. Robot? Uh huh. I, Robot. What's that, what's that robot show? Yeah. Anyway, you got him who is 36, <laughs> and they're auditioning for the same right. role, which tells me that the script probably has a little bit of flexibility in it, and they're putting a little bit more weight on who it is. The one name, I mean, none of these names jump out. Colton Haynes, actually, who was on Arrow and stuff like that. Dave Franco is a weird interesting. one. Dave Franco is a weird one, but yeah. I do like him as an actor. I'll say that. The name Logan Lerman is the one that kind of stands out to me. It's not a name I would have thought of and not a name I would have pulled out. Um, I mean, I don't know if we want to see uh, him necessarily. It would really depend on the type of Han Solo that they're going for, right? right? So I don't know. What do you think, Mark? What stands out to you here? This production is flowing from one side of this galaxy to the other to see somebody who can possibly play Han Solo. The problem with all these names I'm hearing so far is that I've seen them in movies before, and those movies have not been about Han Solo. So now I have a different version. Like when I see Aaron Taylor Johnson, I'm thinking Kick-Ass or the boring guy from Godzilla. I'm not thinking Han Solo. I've mm, seen so much right. of them on screen, and it's like, no, that's not, that's not who that guy is. So I would 
would actually prefer to have an unknown or somebody that we haven't seen a lot of be Han Solo because it's easier for them to disappear Anthony into Gruber? another role. Anthony and Gruber would be a great choice who was in Age of Adeline for like five seconds, but he played a young Harrison Ford's character. I don't know if he can act, though. Like, I really don't. Yeah. I haven't seen yeah. much of his stuff on YouTube. He does a great Harrison Ford impression. You need a lot more than that to be the lead in a Han Solo movie, but he's off to a good start. I wonder if he is one of the, you know, 2,500 people they looked at. Well, I know. I mean, and thanks to the fans, it's Taron Egerton. Uh, Thank and you very that much. That is yes. the that is the kid. I think is I think he's got every he's because yeah he did Kingsman and Kingsman did really well and was was a hit, but he's still not known to the public as oh, no, well. He's like not he, a household like, name. I can't. I, yeah. I love the movie and I can't remember the poor kid's name. So he, I really th and I think that the uh, Lord Miller are very high on him as well too. So I think I, I'm pretty sure he's going to get it. He could be like he could be Han Solo in a movie where like Han Solo has to pretend he's British for two hours, so <laughs> he doesn't have to drop the accent. I'm it's telling you. Easy. Percy Jackson solo. You keep your <laughs> eyes open for that. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Natasha, what do we got? All right. Last night, the newest full trailer for the upcoming highly anticipated film, Batman vs. Superman, debuted. Fearing the actions of a godlike superhero left unchecked, Gotham City's own formidable, forceful vigilante takes on the Metropolis's most revered modern day savior, while the world wrestles with what sort of hero it really needs. And with Batman and Superman at war with one another, a new threat quickly, quickly arises, putting mankind in greater danger than it's ever known before. Mark, buy or sell this new Batman versus Superman trailer. <laughs> I get to kick off this party. All <laughs> right. This is a very hard trailer to decide whether I buy it or sell it because there's a lot of things about the trailer that let me down. It's mainly what they showed us. I'm going to buy this trailer, however, because the movie looks great. A trailer's primary job is to sell us on a movie. Now, was I already sold on this movie? But From the previous footage, yes. Was I sold on this movie as soon as I heard Batman v Superman? Of course I was. This trailer just made me like it even more, particularly the scenes with Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent talking when they weren't superheroes because we've already seen them as you know these huge physical behemoths going at each other when you see them verbally sparring that was really well done to me I like seeing Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor come on up and and just butt his nose in their conversation love that did they show too much of course they did. You didn't need to show Doomsday. You didn't need to show them at the end teaming up. Now it's not even Batman v Superman anymore. Now the, the movie's simply Dawn of Justice because they revealed way too much. They showed too much of their hand. However, I still liked watching this trailer. It was a great piece of art in and amongst itself. Just showed us a little too much. I think the, the, th the key thing here was not that they showed us too much, was that they showed us the one thing they shouldn't have shown. It was mm. the one thing they shouldn't have shown. I really like this trailer up to a point. Yeah. Up to about minute two, that dialogue going on between Bruce and Clark was great. Like, maybe it's the Gotham kid in me. We don't like clowns dressed up in wh whatever it is he said. Obviously an allusion to the Joker and talking, he's dissing Superman right to Superman's face. I even don't mind, a lot of people were complaining about the Lex Luthor portrayal in there. I even don't mind the Lex Luthor portrayal if they're setting up that Lex Luthor is doing a Bruce Wayne, where in public he has this facade. Hey, I'm just kind of the lighthearted, blah, blah. But then behind closed doors, whoosh, dark. You know, they're doing that. Now, if it turns out that that's Lex Luthor all the way through and he's just playing another, you know, Riddler, J Jim Carrey Riddler, I'm going to be I'm going to be annoyed. But you're absolutely right. By sh the movie is called Batman versus Superman. And now you show us when they're past the fight. And now we're working together. Stupid. We all knew they were going to start working together, but that was done. I'm going to withhold my judgment on what I think about the whole Doomsday type character at this point. Or what, what is that? The Abomination got out of prison and now he's yeah. fighting Superman? Okay, whatever. <laughs> That's fine. But for more on the newest Batman versus Superman trailer, let's go to Movie Talk special correspondent John Schnepp. What's up, everybody? Where did you come from? Hey! Oh. <laughs> Just Natasha just got in. so ugly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I love you. Come on, I guys. I love that guy right over there. Um, the Ant May Project so, is off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's done. I, I'm tearing up the script, Alice. Um, it's like Keith Richards and Mick Jagger. Me and Natasha are going to start writing the Ant May script. Um, <laughs> Batman v Superman, the second trailer for me. Uh, I'm, I had to chime in. Uh, I loved the first minute and a half of it, and then. And it, with the minus exception of the Lex Luthor character, I thought Jesse Eisenberg's portrayal of Lex Luthor in this trailer per particularly was really grating, annoying, and reminded me of like that Batman and Robin kind of campiness 
which I don't like. I know that this trailer was trying to self-correct the grim and gritty version of that everyone thinks that you know there's no funniness, it's, it's just dark, and it's just them punching each other the whole movie. So they tried to, and I thought they did with with Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent talking to each other and their conversation back and forth. I liked that they created that rivalry right right away. That, that there's there's a battle brewing. Then they showed some more sequences of Batman and Superman fighting. I think where the trailer spun out of control is the reveal of Doomsday yeah. showing the actual, the way they create Doomsday, like some kind of weird, like Lex Luthor's now Frankenstein. He's like, I've created a monster and lightning. Then the abomination shot of Doomsday where he looks like a Ninja Turtle and yeah. abomination. Everyone's kind of saying, well, he's going to grow the bone spikes. Well, why even just show him with the bone spikes? Why show then? him at all? Yeah. I agree. They shouldn't have shown him at all. And they should definitely have not shown that. La is, is she with you? I thought she was with you. I know it's like some funny pitter patter, but it's a shot of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, and then the title Batman v Superman shows up. It felt like you just ruined the movie. I mean, I really, I mean, I know we all kind of surmised when you saw the very first long trailer where they showed Wonder Woman, they showed Batman, Superman fighting. We kind of figured eventually they'll become friends because there's that scene where they tear the cart, you know, the Batmobile thing off, and they're both standing there facing each other. I didn't need to see any more than that. I was already going to buy my ticket. I feel like the people who cut this trailer together are really treating everyone on the planet as dumb morons when they when they show the In end the defense, of the movie. Many of us are. Hey, <laughs> I'm a dumb moron, but I didn't think that they would show the end of the movie yeah. in the trailer. And I, and it, maybe it's not the end. It's not the credits are rolling right there. Obviously, they're gonna fight the Doomsday Monster, and then something else will happen. But that's pretty much Act Three. That's kind of that's my guess. You know, so. I, I'm not going to buy the trailer. I'm not going to sell it. It's somewhere in the middle for me. I buy the first minute and a half. I sell really hard the last, like, 30 seconds. And a memo just came in. Captain America would like his shield back, Wonder mm. Woman. <laughs> uh, anyway, Christian, your thoughts on the trailer? I buy the Batman v Superman trailer. I sell the Dawn of Justice trailer. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it, right? <laughs> that's really what it is. And it's a lot of the points that you guys just covered. But I think what the main thing is, as far as that line goes with Is She With You, I think that it's going to serve the actual scene well. Mm -hmm. I think the actual movie, it'll work. It didn't work in this trailer because of what you and I were talking about with Civil yes. War. When you saw that D23 footage for Civil War, they threw in the Ant-Man stuff, and it worked because it was just a bunch of footage, and the tone was, it was kind fun of- fun and funny. It, it showed you what it was. And then when they showed the one that they premiered on Jimmy Kimmel, it was just down to business, let's go. Now, I saw, you know, there was a, a commenter who said, well, what, well, you guys don't care that they showed Black Panther in the trailer. The difference is, is that it doesn't change the tone of the movie. It's part of the movie. When they show Black Panther, yeah. it's a scene, it's a part that furthers the story as where, and not that, that, that um, Doomsday is not going to do that, but it's they're selling you on Batman v Superman. That's what it is, and you want to go in there, and you, of course we all assume that they're going to team up because uh, we know that they're going to do the Justice League down the line. They have to team up. But we don't want to see that in the trailer. We want to we want to think you know start just envisioning how is that going to happen, and then when it happens in the movie, you're like, okay, great, it finally happened. But now you see it. They showed so much. This is that thing that studios do sometimes. Where they feel like, don't worry, guys. And, and I think maybe they think that they have to catch up with Marvel somehow. That they, that they're showing everything and that this big universe. And, and yes, you're going to get Wonder Woman. You're going to get the the Justice League. They're going to form. But you had so much because that first minute and a half is. Awesome! I this love, movie, love the first. This half movie of this looks great. It really does. Like I was all on board, and then I'm like, no, 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 no! Don't, don't show any more. That's we're good. We're good. And mm -hmm. then I don't necessarily love the look of of um, Doomsday. Doomsday, but the fact that he's in it. I do, I do like. I just don't want to. I just don't want to see it yet. Right. I, just, ah, so I, just, I love who's the who's the douchey photographer who's talking to Clark Kent. He's like, you don't know who that is. That's Bruce Wayne. It's like, you're oh, such a loser. oh, it's like, dude, are you? Are, do you not realize you're standing right next to Superman? How <laughs> right. stupid are you? Right. <laughs> and you know, I, and I gotta say this too about that little joke sequence. Like, I thought she was with you. I thought she was with you. Okay, I'll say this though. Hell, I love Affleck's Batman voice. Oh, yeah. I love mm -hmm. Affleck's Batman voice. And you know what? You were kind of alluding to this, and we were talking about this beforehand. <laughs> I believe that scene where it says, I thought you were she was with you, I thought she was with you. I think in the context of the movie and in the context mm -hmm. of that scene, I bet those lines are going to work. Yeah. Yep. And I bet they're going to work great. But that this trailer was not the place to put mm -mm. it because all the rest of this trailer is kind of grim and like, like what all this violence is about to brew and all this kind of stuff. And then they throw in the joke. And it just did not fit. And so 
Hey, I, I agree with uh, like you. The, you put it perfectly. I love the I buy the Batman v Superman. I sell the Donna Justice one. So I mean, where do they go from from here with this? Because now they've just done the reveal. Now we should keep this in mind too. What if? What if? What, that scene with Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. What if that's Act Two? What if that's actually really early? And what if? Now here's something I brought up to Christian. And follow me at home if, if you're with me on this. And I'd love to hear Schnepp's thought thought on this as well. In the trailer so far, we've seen Batman in two different outfits. Mm -hmm. We've seen him in the traditional Batman outfit, and we've seen him in kind of the Dark Knight armor, right? right. The assumption I've had, based on nothing, just assumption, has been that there are multiple fights between Batman and Superman. Round one, Superman kicks some ass. Batman's just in his regular outfit, gets away and realizes, I need to armor up. Then in fight two, he comes at Superman in the armor, starts stomping him through ceilings and all that kind of stuff. That's just been my assumption. In that scene where Doomsday shows up, what outfit is Batman wearing? Mm. He's wearing the first outfit. So that leads me to wonder, is there still another Batman and Superman fight to come later in the film? Did Superman or did Batman go from his traditional outfit to the armor back to the traditional mm -hmm. outfit? So it raises a lot of interesting questions that I will admit, while I hate the way they ended this trailer, if that scene happens somewhere in Act 2 and it still progresses from there where Batman and Superman are still at each other's throats, I'll probably forgive it at that point. But on the surface right now, it looks like they just showed us the third act of the film and that was a stupid move. Mm -hmm. Stupid move. Any other thoughts before we... I mean, I know when Christian and I are kicking the crap out of each other and then Schnepp shows up, we take a break from beating each other <laughs> right. up to look at the next thing that showed right. up. But yeah, I mean, overall, I, I still think it, it strongly indicates that what's going to happen in the third act, but it, you're right. They might throw us a curveball. Well, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is what's that scene with Batman with the desert camel with all those flying right. insects? Oh, creatures? the parademons, like uh, Darkseid's parademons. So that's it what has everyone, to be a nightmare. Is saying, everyone is saying that those are Darkseid's parademons. Or they look like them. They look like yeah. them. So, but then, you know, we were, we were all conjecturing, is it a dream sequence? Is it a nightmare? The action figure, they've already called it Nightmare Batman. I was still like saying, hey, it's probably part of the movie. And then when I saw that trailer <laughs> with the demon little floaty creatures, I was like, all right, it's a nightmare. You know what they remind me of? They remind me of those little creatures in uh, Star Wars, Attack of the Clones. Yeah, the Geonosians. Oh, yeah. No, the yeah. 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 The Geonosians. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's what I thought it was. So I guess that is a dream sequence. I mean, I, I, I highly doubt that it is like act two. I think they just... They, you know. Oh, I know. I'm just trying to be optimistic. No, I know. I, I would love to. I would love to think that too. I just. I feel like you're. Everyone's right that the when they finally have that scene in the movie, it'll feel right. Like because Batman and Superman have already been fighting. They become friends. Wonder Woman shows up. They both know Wonder Woman in some, certain different ways. So I'm sure it'll all make sense. Uh, did they? Uh, you know, everyone's on the same page. They should not have shown the, yeah. the last yeah. 20 yeah. seconds. Should, should just not, not have happened. happened. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, we will move, We will let Schnepp. Thanks see for you stopping later. in, yep. Schnepp. Take care. I'll see you Schnepp's later. Schnepp's going to be on Jedi Council with yo, me, yo, Mark, yo. Christian, a little bit later today. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yoda <laughs> says hello. Go get my DVD. And now we will welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Did Schnepp bring his lucky Yoda? I oh, believe he brought his lucky Yoda. <laughs> Was Natasha's that for me first, on my first day, like I know, Yoda? she was kicked out of her chair on her first day. Unbelievable. Yeah, getting rid of me already. <laughs> All right, what's next? Okay, next we have the first official image from the upcoming Warner Bros. film, The Nice Guys, has just hit the web. Directed by Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and Iron Man 3, director Shane Black, the film stars Ryan Gosling as a down-in-his-luck private detective and Russell Crowe as a hired muscle who have to team up to solve the case of a missing girl and a seemingly unrelated death of a porn star, an investigation that leads them to uncover far-reaching conspiracy of corruption. In an er interview with our own Collider.com, Gosling described the project like this. It's Shane Black. He's a world unto himself. His world is so funny and crazy. I had such a great time. Russell Crowe is so funny in the movie. I can't wait for people to see what... I can't wait for people to see that in his movie. It's not a side of himself that he shows very often, but he's hysterical. John, buy or sell what you're seeing and hearing from the nice guys. Buy, buy, buy huge. First of all, if you have not seen Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, you've got to treat yourself. You want to know how really uh, Robert Downey Jr. got the role of Iron Man? It was because of Shane Black and what he was able to do with him in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I think that was like the trump card that gave the studio some confidence that, okay, maybe this guy John Favreau wants can Was work. it Gothica? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, who knew? Um, so bringing Shane Black, I and look, Iron Man 3 is not my favorite Marvel film, but I really like what Shane Black did with it. It was a little bit of a different thing than what they've done in a lot of Marvel films, so I appreciate the sensibilities he's brought to it. 
this movie just sounds awesome. And I still believe that if you take Daniel Day-Lewis out of the equation, I still think Russell Crowe is the best actor on the planet. So see him get in a film like this. It's got a little bit of L.A. Confidential feel to it, though. But yeah. this picture is just... I love this picture. I think this looks great. I think the premise sounds great. This whole mystery noir set in like the 70s thing is great. Made with Shane Black directing it. These two guys in it. I can't be more excited for this movie. For me, it's a big buy. Christian? It's a huge buy for me. When I when I worked at Silver Pictures, the first movie that I got to work on and go was Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Nice. And I and I the studio didn't support it at all. It was it found its life through people watching it like on DVD and Blu-ray and and watching the brilliance of what Shane Black can do when he's in his world and to hear the comments of Ryan Gosling going, it's so crazy to be in Shane Black's world. This is what you want from Shane Black. Because look, whatever you think about Iron Man 3, right? As a Marvel Cinematic Universe fan, I understand where people were pissed off about that movie. I get it in that one sense. But if you look at it as a Shane Black movie, it's a Shane Black movie. Now, whether or not it, it deserves to be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's another argument altogether. But when he does movies like this, when he does movies to where it's just his uh, his creation, characters. When you when you hear Ryan Gosling say, "You never seen Ryan, Russell Crowe like this." Sometimes you just hear actors say that. Well, you never seen uh, you know Pauly Shore like this. You always see Pauly Shore that way. This way, you ne <laughs> I believe it. I hear I hear the words coming out of his mouth because I know what the script can do. He's one of the most brilliant writers, different writers. Huge buy. I can't wait to see this movie. Mark? Yeah, it's a buy for me, too. I mean, it's a long drop-off to talk from one of the most anticipated trailers of all time to a picture of a movie, but this thing looks great. This image yeah. that we saw, because it looks like Russell Crowe might be starting to adopt that later in his career Robert De Niro kind of thing where I've been this tough guy, this mob boss for so long, now I'm going to be in a comedy and it's going to blow people away. Same thing with Russell Crowe. Is that tough guys can be funny? This looks a little bit like the other guys to me. Maybe a more serious version or a better storyline, but it looks like it's going to be a a very funny movie. I myself, in reference to your question earlier and your praise, I have not seen Kiss Kiss. Oh man! Oh, you treat see yourself. I've seen Kiss. <coughs> I've seen Kiss yeah. many times. They kicked ass and bang. All right, <laughs> what's next? Variety is reporting that former 90210 star Jason Priestley is set to direct a feature biopic of former Saturday Night Live comedy star Phil Hartman to be titled Nice Guy Phil. Producer of the film Tyler Levine said the following about the project. Comedians are notoriously complex people and Phil was no exception. Anyone that knew him always says that he was the nicest guy they ever met. Christian, buy or sell a biopic on the late Phil Hartman? Oh, what a buy. Big buy. I love Phil Hartman and does this guy deserve to get a movie about his life, man? Um, one of the most talented and underrated I, not only just comedians and people of all time. I mean, he really wasn't tragic. Tragic what happened to him and and the, the mental problems that that his wife had, and it ultimately led to his death. And it's interesting that Jason Priestley is doing. And a lot of people don't realize Jason Priestley's been doing a lot of directing, um, and it's kind of the career that he's wanted to go. And I, that's one of the reasons I buy it as well too, because I want to see. Because this could be one of those movies. Remember, Ron Howard was Opie for a long time. Yes. <laughs> and when Ron Opie Howard Cunningham. started directing, oh, Opie's directing movies. And the next thing you know, you don't think of him as Opie anymore. You think of the guy who directed yeah. Rush. And I was in our heart to see. He's a he's Apollo 13, 13. He's a great, great director. Now, could Jason Priestley be the next Ron Howard? I don't know. But what, <laughs> yeah. I, but what I'm saying is that it gives him a chance to do this kind of material. If he can churn out a great movie about Phil Hartman, he'll get himself on the map because this is a story that should be told and it's a story that could be told with the right actor. Big buy. I'm Troy McClure. You might remember me from such <laughs> films as A Snack in the Pantry, A Cannibal Story. Yeah, I, Phil Hartman did so much great stuff from, I mean, he, he will be legendary to me forever because of what he did on The Simpsons, right. voice on The Simpsons, but also, also legendary to me. No one else will remember him for this, specifically when you first think of Phil Hartman. But his small role in So I Married an Axe Murderer as the Alcatraz tour guide, I, I still laugh myself sick every time I see that movie and see me. And then he had that, uh, what was that show, Radio? Um, news, uh, radio? news Radio. Oh, yeah, news right. Radio that he was on for a long time. Yep. Of course, he was one of the best performers ever in a great era of Saturday Night Live and such a tragic end to his life that is still, I still don't really fully understand. I don't think yeah. a lot of people do, but I love this notion. I want to see a story on this guy's life. So for me, it's a buy. Yeah, as long as Jason Priestley doesn't cast Luke Perry to play Bill Hartman, <laughs> I am so locked into this 
just because, like you guys have mentioned too, he's he's my. I think he's the fifth greatest Saturday Night Live cast member of all time. And an argument can be made that he's the greatest of all time because he was such an anchor for everybody else to go do their crazy things. And anytime you're doing sketch comedy, you need somebody to ground it. He always did. Go back and watch the Matt Foley motivational speaker sketch where Chris Farley gets oh, to be maybe the funniest we've ever seen him. Phil Hartman is one of the reasons why that sketch works because he doesn't break character. You need somebody like that. He was the he was the the epitome of professionalism. So the fact that he's getting a movie, regardless of how good or bad the movie's going to end up being, I think is long overdue. <laughs> Jason Priestley directing or is it's something that I didn't really consider. I've always thought of him as Brandon Walsh. Love him as Brandon Walsh. So this is a fun new adventure for him. Fun fact, if you watch the Van Halen Hot for Teacher video, the voice <laughs> of Waldo is Phil Hartman. Oh, that's awesome. Good mm-hmm. to know. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, we're going to save a minute or two at the end of the show. We're running a little over time to take some of your live Twitter questions. Maybe if you're lucky, you can get one in right now. Tweet us at Collider Video. But for now, let's get to the mailbag. So, Natasha, what do we got? Tom Childer writes, Hello, Collider crew. I'm a huge fan of all kinds of music, but I especially like rap. I was wondering if you think there could be a BC Boys biopic. With the success of Straight Outta Compton, I think seeing the lives of one of the most influential rap groups would be very interesting, especially with the passing of MCA. Anyways, thank you. I remember, some of you know this, some of you will find this astonishing. I was a professional break dancer uh, around the age of like... I want video. You know, I know. You I, know. I actually got paid for break dancing. And so back in the day, I was listening to a lot of Houdini. I was listening to a lot of Beastie Boys. I was listening to a lot of Run DMC at the time. And so I remember too, because I was into that kind of music, right? But it was not mainstream yet, like at all. And I remember the Beastie Boys were kind of like the first guys because before the Arsenio Hall show was the Arsenio Hall show, it was the Joan Rivers show. Right. And Joan Rivers had the Beastie Boys when their uh, album License to Ill came out. And Joan Rivers didn't even know how to, she, she couldn't even pronounce it. Wait, it's License to Ill, Kill? Is this supposed to be Kill? Ill. Okay, License to Ill, the Beastie Boys. And they performed, and I remember as a kid, I was like, oh my God, like the stuff that we're listening to is in the mainstream. We, I'd never seen anything like that before. They have a huge musical influence on a lot of people. And when you look at their lives, they're not just, some people want biopics on certain musicians just because they like their music. When you actually look at the life stories of the Beastie Boys and a couple of the members in particular, MCA, there's tragedy, there is like big life mistakes, and there's a story to tell basically. So personally, I'd be all for it. What about you? Yeah, if this movie has anything close to the entertainment value of the sabotage video, then I am so into <laughs> this movie. I was I never grew up a huge Beastie Boys fan. I got into them later in life, but their history is tremendous and definitely deserves a cinematic treatment. They were the they played on the last night at Max's Kansas City, the legendary New York club venue um and like that when they left def jam and went to capital there's a lot of things that you could tell um, it's it's going to be interesting to see what they focus on because straight out of compton did a phenomenal job of focusing both on the personal lives of the members involved and showing their musical career i don't know if you can do it that easily with the beastie boys movie but i want to give it a shot christian i absolutely want to see a beastie boys movie for i mean even in the reference said what was really cool about Straight Outta Compton when you were watching as well too was, was the way that they incorporated the music into what it meant for the yeah. band and everything too. And I would love to see that with the Beastie Boys. I was a big Beastie Boys fan, and their story is something that should be told. And and everything that they did is as not, not. I mean, just politically and stuff that they did as well too, not just with the music. So it's it's a it's a movie that I hope happens, and I think you know that like we've talked about many times on this show. What studios do, and you had said yesterday more that it's a it's it's an, a moral choice. It's like whatever they're whatever they're going at, whatever's making money for them. Straight Outta Compton did pretty well. We may yep. hear about a a, a best uh, supporting actor nomination, maybe maybe not. Um, that should lead to more of these, and I hope that the Beastie Boys are one of them in the in the fray. But here's the big question: like, like when you're a pro in karate, you get a black belt. When you're a pro in golf, you get a PGA Tour card. When you're a <laughs> pro in break dancing, what do you get? <laughs> yeah, like, what's right. the how do, you, how do you chicks. earn your card? I got a head to toe Adidas windbreaker outfit, and I actually got paid to right. go dance at so some gigs. So you could gigs. do all, like you could spin on your head and stuff. I yes, I did. The wow. head spin was something I used to. And I used to spin, no video of this. And I used to spin other people on my head. That was Why? that Get was yeah, I was I was this size when I was like. So if I pay you, would you let Schnapp spin on your head? Uh, I, I I would certainly not want to try. Oh, dude, Christmas Christmas party here is next weekend. Right, we have a Christmas party here. We'll get a couple shots of Jack in him, and then we'll do some breakdance. Yes. All right, before this goes any further, what's the next question? (laughs) 
<laughs> Dennis Kirkard Jensen writes, Hi, Campia's Collider crew. Time to get really sweaty. Everybody is talking about Batman vs. Su- Superman as the first DCEU movie, forgetting that Man of Steel or the events in Man of Steel clearly is going to have a great impact on the franchise as a whole. Man of Steel featured a prequel comic where it's revealed that in the open pod within the scout ship used to be Supergirls. And with Darkseid rumored to be the villain of the Justice League Part 1 and 2, what do you think are the chances of Superman Batman, the Supergirl from Krypton issues 8 through 13, or simply Superman Batman Apocalypse being the source material for those movies? Bring on the filthy. I think the likelihood of those being source material are thin. Like, really, there is no source material for Batman v Superman. I mean, that's, they've drawn inspiration from several sources, as a matter of fact. I have very little doubt that they could go in the direction of drawing inspiration from those issues, but I don't think anything's going to serve as source material. We have brought up a number of times on this show over the past couple of years, ever since uh, that initial prequel comic to Man of Steel came out, where we saw... Uh, Kara, I believe her name, her name is, Superman's cousin, thousands of years ago, crash land on Earth, but get out and walk away. Now, in Man of Steel, when Superman finds that ship, he sees one pod with a dead skeleton in it, and he finds the other pod open and empty. That was the one that we assume was the one that Kara got out and walked away from. And we thought, what will be the repercussions of that? They didn't do that for no reason. We've speculated on the show. Could she then become the descendant, what would become the Amazonian race? That where we see Wonder Woman come from, could Wonder Woman be a direct descendant and have some Kryptonian uh, power, some Kryptonian blood in her? Possibility. Could she have evolved in what became, you know, the uh, Atlantean race? With Who knows? But it does provide DC with a built-in mechanism for explaining what we would call supernatural superpowers in the world. Or it could be nothing at all. I tend to believe that Kara Zorel walking away from that ship, I do believe that will play into the origins of either Wonder Woman or some other race of some sorts. I think it's got to play a role in it. I don't know. What do you think, Mark? It's a great speculation. Yeah, they're going to use a lot of different versions of source material. I think Superman Batman Apocalypse or Batman Superman Apocalypse is also going to play into this storyline in the Justice League Part 1 and 2 somehow. But let's not forget, I don't think a lot of people aren't aware that Man of Steel started this new universe. Now, whatever you think about that movie, I know some people love it. Some people aren't huge fans of it. But at the very least, it gave us a great universe in which to tell more stories so i think people acknowledge man of steel as the beginning of that yeah i think people absolutely acknowledge it because i mean even even when you see the trailer the last trailer for batman v superman and you flash you're flashing back to the destruction that happened at the end of of man of steel that you you have to you're, pay, you're saying, look, this is what happened in that other movie. Remember it because it has an impact on the universe going further. Now, as far as the Supergirl, Supergirl stuff, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that what they did, again, taking looking at what had happened throughout the Marvel Cinematic Universe and saying, okay, they set things up, you, you should take... Um, clues from them and 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 things that they have done and and set that up and I think that that's what they did and I love your idea as far as maybe she was the one who started off the Am- Amazons I think that's a great thing and even if that's not necessarily that particular one they will be setting up these little Easter eggs throughout the universe that's why they need and they this movie Batman v Superman is going to make so much money bank so much money and then I think Suicide Squad is going to do really well so it's like I'm just I just as long as it's good. As long as Batman for, Superman, Batman for Superman is good and we can start dropping these Easter eggs and making them pay off, I it's gotta absolutely be really yeah. good. Yeah. It's got to be really good. It's, it's, it's kind of got to be great. The hottest thing in the comment section right now is give Natasha back to Marvel. So uh, <laughs> there's that. All right. One more question. All right. Aaron LeBlanc writes, what's the difference between science fiction and fantasy? That is actually a great question to which a lot of movie fans are saying, that's a stupid question. But no, it's actually a really good question. Um, so I'll let Christian answer it. I'm just, I'm just no. going to tell you that, that Star Wars is not science fiction. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. So it's, it's, it's sci-fi fantasy. So that's combining the two of them as where science fiction is more in, set more in, in the real and with things that, that possibly could have like, like Star Trek is science fiction. It's based off stuff that, you know, that this possibly could happen and, and evolve. And that's why we get into this conversation all the time about gravity. So I don't want to get into another uh, comment war about gravity. It's not science fiction. It is. Um, it's very much science fiction. Yes. yes. But uh, anyway, so I mean, I, I just think it's it's more as where fantasy is. If you look at something like Lord of the Rings, obviously a fantasy movie. And if you had a spaceship in 
Lord of the Rings, it would still be fantasy. That, I guess that's the best way to do it. To think about it. If you want to put like a fantasy movie, put you, fit any any movie that you know which is fantasy, whether it be Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or, or Willow, and start putting spaceships or other sci-fi type mechanisms in that world, that's more sci-fi fantasy than it is just actual science fiction that could be could happen off of uh, theories and speculation. Yeah, I mean, I heard th this once that sci-fi. Somebody once described, and I wish I remember who it was, as speculative future casting. As where could all this go with the, you know, with where we're going scientifically, technologically, all that kind of stuff. Where could that all lead us in the future? Whatever. A lot. That's why a lot of people hold up Star Trek as like the ultimate example of sci-fi. I thought. Um, Oh, there's been a lot of great sci-fi movies, but and fantasy is you're right. It's more like the Lord of the Rings and Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. It's the pure fantasy. It's the the pure mythical. It's the pure whatever. Whereas sci-fi, and that's when then you get into issues like Star Wars, where you're right, where there's a lot of sci-fi slash fantasy as well. So how would you define? I it? know you guys are nerds. Where's the gym? <laughs> um, I yeah. I mean, look, this is, you can get in semantic debates about this. Like, like, what is Lord of the Rings primarily, or what is Star Wars primarily? Just don't forget to enjoy. The movie. When I was a kid, we used to have to go to a place to rent movies. You couldn't just do it on Netflix, so I'd go to Video Update. And Star Wars was always in the science fiction section. Why? Because there was no fantasy section. So I, that's how I always look at it. I acknowledge that Star Wars is primarily a fantasy. The movie starts with, uh, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far right. away, which is like once upon a time. It's a fantasy movie. Labyrinth is a fantasy movie. Lord of the Rings, fantasy movie. Science fiction is more like what you said. Star Trek, stuff like that. But you can combine. I think it's there's a lot of films that combine both. Both of those elements so let's just enjoy the movies right. and not worry about what to label them children of men sci-fi yeah all right folks we've reached that part of the show right at the end and i said we would take a little bit of time take some of your twitter questions we're going to do that right now the person you got to suck up to is natasha she is the gatekeeper today so natasha what have you picked out of the twitter sphere all right well since we're talking about lord of the rings which is also my favorite adam <laughs> writes which prequel trilogy was worse the hobbit or star wars my pick is the hobbit just because i didn't even bother saying three um, I look while I think that the Hobbit movies were a clear step down from the quality of the Lord of the Rings. I still enjoyed the Hobbit movies. I, I still thought they were worthwhile films to see. So I got to go. Prequels was the worst out of them. It's weird. Not you, the cheese edits. The, no, the no, I'm not going anti-cheese edits. edits. I'm not talking anti-cheese. But what I am, what I will say though, as far as better made movies overall, Hobbit are the better movies but as far as what's more memorable the prequels are more memorable um because they still have an impact in the balls is memorable too. No, 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 no. for the no, wrong no, no. reasons I'm, no, I'm talking about as far as still impacting stories they right. they were all they, they they still impacted uh the the clone war series that came out there's still going to be stuff that happens in future movies the history is still there so there's still elements and parts of the prequels that still matter very much is where the hobbit is pretty much forgettable i mean there's not between smaug and a few other other things it's kind of forgettable. Better made movies, for sure, but and better acted. But I just think as far as overall with legacy and lore, I think the, the prequels have more to them. Yeah, All right. but the, the first Hobbit movie, I think, is the, is the most well-made out of any of the six. But after we've been doing these commentaries on Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, I don't despise the prequels like I thought I might watching them again. I can, I can see myself revisiting them <laughs> a lot more so than a Hobbit movie. Like, I don't need to see any of those Hobbit movies ever again. They just didn't do that much for me. I liked a lot of them. I didn't like the last one, but... I think I get more out of Star Wars still, probably because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So uh, I'm gonna, I'll go with the Star Wars prequels are better. All right, what's next? Okay, Cine Series E superhero says, <laughs> which trailer was better, yesterday's Batman versus Superman or the Civil War one? Oh, Civil War, Civil War, Civil War, Civil War. Yeah. E easy. Like if now if you showed me again the Batman v Superman trailer and it just stops at two minutes might have a new discussion, but I'd probably still lean towards Civil War. I still like the Batman v Superman trailer that we got at Comic-Con better than the Civil War one. But as far as this new Batman v Superman trailer versus this most recent Civil War trailer, you gotta go Civil War, don't you? I, I go Civil War also because, and it's also not fair to Batman v Superman because we have so much history already with these yeah. characters in Civil War. I mean, it's the, the emotion behind, look, the really cool scene in Batman v Superman is that scene when Bruce Wayne's talking to Clark. But I don't. I know Ben Affleck. I don't know that version of Bruce Wayne yet. I want to, and I'm and I'm sure that I'm going to like him in that role. But when I but I still see Ben Affleck right now. When I see Tony Stark saying, you know, so was I. 
I see Tony Stark saying that because I've seen the history yeah. between him and, and Steve over the years. So I'm right now the emotion was there a little bit more for me in the Civil War trailer. It was still a game at the two minute yeah. warning, yeah. and then <laughs> Civil War blew it out well of the water. Said. I mean, a trailer has two jobs. It's supposed to sell you on the movie, which both these uh, trailers did fantastically. But it also can't give away too much. And Civil War didn't give us a lot. And Batman v Superman might have given us too much. The finale of the movie. All right, what's next? All right, Brad Hughes writes, if episode seven isn't great, will you still care about episode eight? Yeah. 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 I mean, you look, I... Uh, you give something more than one chance. And if the, if episode seven is not so good... Look, and there's a difference between not so good and out just outright terrible. If it's outright terrible, uh, one, I take up drinking. Um, <laughs> two, I lock myself in a dark closet and cry a lot. I mean, so there's a lot of bad oh, things. You want to hang out this week? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like we got a yeah. date. Yeah. So a lot of bad things are going to happen if on the 14th when the three of us go to the world premiere. <laughs> looking forward to that. Uh, if it's not good, you're going to see. By the way, um, on the 14th, that is when the world premiere of Star Wars The Force Awakens is. We just made plans that uh, the three of us, and we're going to see if we can loop in uh, Tiffany as well. Yeah. We're going to come straight back here to the studio. As long as there's not an after party. We're going to come straight back here to the studio and we are going to film our review of Star Wars Force Awakens. It'll be a spoiler free one. Right. We'll save the spoiler one for after the movie releases and all of you have a chance to see it. But uh, yeah, keep your eye open for that. Would, what about you? Would if, if it's bad, will it affect your... If it's your... bad. Not um, horrible, but just oh, bad. If it's, no, I'm still going to want to see episode eight because here's the reason why. Let's, let's say hard, the nightmare situation that it is bad. Okay, let's say right. Attack of the Clones bad, right? Right. Um, what that would do is go, oh, man, what was J.J. doing? He made the wrong... Because the difference is when you said that about, let's say, Attack of the Clones, and then you had to look forward to another movie that George Lucas was still, still writing, directing. Still directing it, yeah. Ryan Johnson's doing the next one. He's doing episode eight. Um, now, this could... The, the exact opposite could happen here because J.J. did so great. And Trevorrow's doing Rogue, Rogue One, right? No, Trevorrow's doing episode nine. Right. Rogue so who, One is Gareth Edwards. Gareth Edwards, thank yeah. you. So when you have episode... If episode eight, seven is not good, and then you have this new director coming on to do it, it's it, you're still going to have a lot of hope to see what he's done because of what he's did with Looper and everything else. Who and and st I still think the story is going to be solid enough that yeah. that you want to see someone else continue it. But I still think I'm going to want to I'm going to miss JJ a bit because I I just have super high hopes. Obviously, I don't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't get it. Yeah. All right, let's take two more questions. Okay, this one comes from Buddy Groove, and he says, Do studios ever listen to fans? There have been uproars about trailers showing too much, and yet B versus S trailer shows too much. Um, there, I've used this analogy a lot. A great NFL football coach once said, when asked by a reporter, do you ever listen to the opinions of the fans? And the NFL coach said, coaches who listen to fans are destined to be sitting with the fans <laughs> next week. Uh, do what you do best. Look, th th what they don't listen. They do listen to fans in so much as what do we think will be effective and make us money. But they pay more attention to what the money tells them. And if they release certain kinds of trailers and then they see that the effect of those trailers and that marketing campaign led to a massive opening weekend, that's what they listen to. Even if the fans come to them and say, we hated that, that you did this in the trailer. Well, how much could you hate it? Because he still came out opening weekend and gave us all that money. Therefore, we're going to repeat that. So to a degree, they listen to fans, but more they follow the money. And if the money tells them that something worked, they'll take the money's opinion over the fans' opinion every time christian what do you think well i think as far as if you look this trailer is i can't even imagine how many million view, millions of views it's going to have soon right and even though a lot of you guys have the same opinions as as us as far as that show too much a lot of you tuned in to hear what we were just going to talk about with the trailer um this is it's a big story right now it's going to get a lot of views so when the studio sees that and then the money does well with the box office i go the trailer worked yeah, that's all they're gonna say. They're not gonna say a couple of the people said it showed too much. Now, if everybody said it showed too much and they didn't see the movie, maybe we showed too much. Yeah. But if they keep showing too much and we go and it's a, it's a, it's slippery slope because you don't want to go. You showed too much. I'm not gonna see your movie because we all want to see Batman versus Superman. So we're gonna go see the movie. So it, it's tough because to them their marketing worked. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's you know whether or not you believe we are all we're talking all about talking it. about yep. the fact that Dar uh, I keep saying Darth, Darth Vader. Like Darth Vader's in the trailer, which was really good. <laughs> he really, that was a surprise. Doomsday. Yes. The fact whether whether you love them or hate him, he's in it. Everyone's talking about him. So to them, it's a success. So they're gonna keep doing this more and more and more. 
But you also can't put the genie back in the bottle with a situation like this. I'm sure there were talks at the studio, like, are we giving away too right. much? And they decided to make an artistic decision, and maybe they did give away too much. But when it's something like, like if you're clamoring for a show to come back or a movie to come back, studios do listen to fans if you're loud enough. Like, like there was no more Family Guy, and then so many people bought the DVDs and said, we want more Family Guy, so now we still have it over 10 years later. But with something like this, they're going to listen to the fans and say they gave away too much. But what are they supposed to do? Like, you can't men in black memory erase everybody and say, oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because the first show didn't give away anything. That's what got all the hardcore fanboys like, oh, sweet. But everybody else, my mom had no idea this movie was coming out. She might after this trailer. See, the next trailer is going to be that final scene where Batman and Superman are beside each other. One woman blocks the shot. They say, I thought she was with you. I thought she was with you. And then all of a sudden, the screen does that. And then Batman sits up in bed. He goes, oh, my God, what a dream. And so they'll, they'll retcon the whole According thing. According to you, half this movie is going to be <laughs> dream <laughs> sequence. Yeah. Everything, even the end credits, will be all dream sequence. All right, last question of the day. All right, this is by far my favorite. Jeff M. Goldblum says, Collider Video, will you guys ever make a breakdancing video? Uh, I'm in. Shoot. I'm in. It would take a lot of money. And look, I, I'm a whore as much as anybody else. You pay me a big enough check. I'm sprawling out the cardboard box right there on the floor, and I will break it down for you. You know, the issue you're going to have is, is is that another person at Collider is a pretty good dancer. That'd be Josh Makuga. He's done dance-offs oh, against yeah. professionals. So if we get Makuga out there first, and he challenges Camp yet That's to a, a dance-off, I like where your head's at, and I'll tell you what. God. And I'll, follow me on Periscope, <laughs> and I'll make it happen. <laughs> like I said, like I said, I'm like Floyd Money Mayor there. Show me the money. Yep. $55 million check. <laughs> I'll do it. All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this heavy, heavy. Like, I cannot believe how many huge stories there were today. This installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing out our friends over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. While you're at it, Click the subscribe button, become a subscriber to our YouTube channel so you can come back and see this movie talk show every single day of the week, Monday through Friday. And we got a lot of other stuff going on here on the channel as well. And hey, while you're at it, click that thumbs up button. It's just a great way of you letting us know that you like the show. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, starting on my left, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? Breakdancing at Twitter and Instagram at 5150Ellis. I'll be at the Tempe Improv December 17th through the 20th. New tour dates for 2016 getting announced tomorrow. So come on back. Here. Nice retro shirt, by the way. Yeah, I like the retro shirt. Throwback. Shirt there. All right, sitting over here on my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Hey, follow me at Dane Cook. Uh, follow me <laughs> at Christian Harloff on both Twitter and Instagram. And are we doing Council Live today? Are we? Have, well, are we? I don't know. I gotta ask. Well, I wasn't sure. I was gonna promote it. On another day. Yeah, <laughs> it's on later it's in the day. Later, so maybe if we can do it live again. You know what? Hell yeah! Let's see. We'll do it. Doing it, it live, we'll do it live today at two thirty. So make sure you watch uh, Jedi that's Council. That's Los Angeles time. Yes, that's myself, John Campion, Mark Ellis, and Boba Schnepp will be on there as well. So make sure you check out Collider Jedi Council today. And, of course, our lovely host today, Miss Natasha Martinez, who is still for what, like 48 more hours? Uh, yeah, on Sunday. Yep, I will be for, a has-been on Sunday. For 48 <laughs> more hours, the current reigning, defending, undisputed Miss California USA, former Los Angeles Laker girl, too, by the yeah, way. Yeah, so I may join the dance Which off. Anne <laughs> loved that, because Anne's a huge Laker judge. fan. You should judge you should the dance judge. Ah, Where? Oh, right, yeah. Where right. can people find you online, Natasha? They can find me on Instagram at Natasha A. Martinez and on Twitter at Natasha Alexis underscore. And, of course, you can find me on the various social media networks on Facebook and on Twitter. Just follow me at John Campy. I want thank the people behind the scenes dennis jonathan wendy schnepp wherever the hell he is right now thank <laughs> you guys most of all remember the most important part of the show is not what the idiots at the table have to say it's what you have to say make sure you jump into the comments section below leave your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discussed here today probably is going to be about batman versus superman <laughs> that'll do it for us guys thanks so much for joining us my name is john campion for collider video and until next time bye bye Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.